Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to this Foundation for Science and Technology event. Uh, my name is David Willits, Chair of the Foundation. Welcome to our physical audience here and also our online participants on Zoom. Do, of course, our online participants feel free to join in with questions and comments, uh, which I will be able to pick up when we move to the panel discussion. Uh, today's uh, discussion, today's event is, can AI be regulated, and if so, how? A subject of such importance, it's secured one of our record audiences here, so important for the FST, indeed the Prime Minister convened an entire global summit to prepare people for this event <laughs> so that we were properly briefed, which we greatly appreciated. Uh, we also appreciate the support from the trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub at the University of Southampton, who have sponsored this event for us. Um, and uh, I should have said, for those following on Zoom, do use the Q&A function, please, not the chat function. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, and it's such an important and diverse uh, issue. We've actually, we're very fortunate. We have uh, here, we have today an excellent record number of speakers, and we're going to start with Stephen Almond. He is Executive Director for Regulatory Risk at the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, so he leads the ICO's teams focused on this issue. He also led a World Economic Forum initiative to promote the use of more agile regulation, promoting innovation, and has worked previously on regulatory roles in government as well. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I am very conscious that um, I stand between you and more uh, entertaining uh, activities after this. And so I thought, um, kind of coming in, um, that uh, if the question is, can artificial intelligence be regulated, as the regulator, I should probably just say yes um, <laughs> uh, and, and sling my hook. But uh, um, apparently, um, uh, at the Royal Society, the, the, the motto is, uh, is nullius in verba and means uh, uh, don't take essentially anybody's word for it, so don't take mine on that count, but we'll see where we get to this evening. Um, I thought perhaps um, uh, the best way of illustrating why I believe that AI can be regulated um, is to talk through what it's like to regulate AI right now. Um, we, of course, um, at the ICO uh, sit at the heart um, of AI regulation, AI being built on, on data, much of it being personal data. And so the questions of how to regulate AI for us are not new. AI is not new, despite all the media hype um, and indeed summits over the last year. Um, uh, therefore, actually, we have a fair bit of experience uh, in how to regulate it and how to get things right. Where we start from um, uh, in uh, the, the sort of the, uh, the world of data protection law is a very principles-based piece of law that sets out some, uh, some very sensible things that we should be thinking about when we're processing personal data, which hope ha also kind of happen to be, although I'm not going to sort of claim any credit for this, very much the sorts of principles that you'll see in the government's white paper for how AI should be regulated. They talk about questions of fairness and bias. They talk about questions of uh, safety and security. They talk about accountability and redress. Um, they talk about transparency and explainability, and these are all core features um, of how data protection law already co governs uh, AI. Now, I'm not here to try and persuade you, rest assured, before anybody gets too panicked, that data protection law is the answer to how to regulate AI. Um, it is very much just one part um, of this particular puzzle. Uh, and we, of course, are seeing... Uh, AI appear in so many different regulatory contexts. We are seeing AI um, uh, used in everywhere from entertainment to financial services um, to medicine. And consequently, it needs to, as a general purpose technology, which 
is applied in lots and lots of different contexts, needs to be brought uh, into conformance with what our expectations are um, for those sorts of activities, particularly where they're currently carried out by humans. That means um, that I hate to break it to anybody who was going to uh, come here and hope that uh, there was going to be some position from me for some sort of single AI regulator and that would just be a really lovely simple solution that would cover all of the challenges of how to govern AI. Um, uh, like all complex problems, the answer is not nearly so simple. Um, the answer, for what it's worth in my view, is actually rather close to uh, what the government has actually set out already in terms of needing to rely on a framework of existing domain-specific regulators um, and therefore to having uh, a common set of approaches across those regulators that joins them up, makes sure that we're not creating any, uh, any issues in terms of conflict between us, but particularly also make sure that there are no major gaps and that we're spotting and acting on those gaps. So where do we as a regulator kind of fit into all this? So I thought I'd give you um, not quite a day in the life of a regulator, but a year in the life of a regulator, because last year was a fun year to be a, a regulator of AI. It was uh, quite, uh, quite the joy um, uh, around um, uh, a year ago um, being sat with my teams, our horizon scanning teams, who were putting out their, um, their annual report for uh, 2023 on the biggest technology trends that were going to be uh, important for data protection, um, and them saying to me, well, we really think that we should put forward generative AI, and me going, nah, no, don't worry about that. Um, uh, uh, the reason, uh, and I do still hold by my reasoning around that, is actually for exactly what I said before. Just as AI is, is not new, the problems and the challenges in terms of how to govern it um, are not always new. And in many respects, for us as a data protection regulator, generative AI was simply another form of AI, um, another set of challenges um, for us to respond with our standards toolkit to and to make sure that we were getting things right. We already have very comprehensive guidance um, on how organizations where they are developing or deploying AI should be building in those core principles in the first instance. And we were quite quick to respond as winter turned to spring, setting out key guidance to the market on the sorts of things that we thought people should be taking note of, our eight top tips for developers and deployers of generative AI. And then following through um, come summertime with a, uh, a uh, innovation advice service, um, uh, which was kind of aptly launched at that, that point in time where we started to get through an awful lot of questions. Right, I'm, I'm planning on doing this sort of thing in my organization. How do, we, how do we go about complying? At the same time, though, we had to do some of the, um, the harder side of being the regulator. We had to start to issue warnings to the market because some of what we were seeing in our scrutiny of the market was some firms who were not taking their existing regulatory re um, requirements very seriously here. Um, we uh, advised firms that we would be knocking on uh, organizations' doors, particularly uh, those organizations that are developing the most powerful models that sit at the, the very top of the food chain um, and we would be looking at their data protection impact assessments to make sure that in the rush to realize commercial opportunity here, we were seeing firms take their obligations seriously and were really embedding privacy by design. Following that, in October of um, this last year, uh, we set out uh, our announcement that we were taking enforcement action against Snap Inc. Um, uh, in respect of their My AI chatbot online, a generative AI chatbot that was widely being used by children where we had uh, concerns that the privacy risk had not been mitigated appropriately. Um, that's, I hasten to add, um, for the lawyers in the room, that is a provisional um, uh, enforcement notice. Um, we're receiving representations. We've not taken a final decision in, in that regard. But I hope that gives you um, uh, some assurance that this is an area where we are taking things very seriously. So what does kind of the future hold for us as an AI regulator then in this space? 
I'd say two things. One is we really need to focus on that challenge around recognizing we're not the only AI regulator by far in this space, and so we are going to need to join up with others. Um, we're going to need to work uh, very carefully, whether it's at a policy level. We've committed with the Competition and Markets Authority to putting out a joint statement on how we are going to regulate uh, foundation models together. Um, putting together also um, a package of support through the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, our AI and digital hub, which will provide that same sort of rapid response support to innovators who have questions around how the law applies um, uh, straight, just as we do at the minute as an individual regulator. So that's the sort of challenge that comes for us in terms of the, the join up. The challenge also comes with responding to the pace. So just uh, like at the start of last year where my teams were saying to me, okay, we, are, um, uh, we really need to lean into this, uh, this generative AI trend. My teams are now saying to me, we need, now need to really lean into personalized large language models. We really need to start thinking about the implications for where you have this being developed in a much more specific way to individuals' own contexts, and we're responding to those. It's a fun time to be an AI regulator. I hope that we can convince you that we're doing a, a half-decent job in this space, and I look forward to the debate. Oh, I guess it all depends on your definition of fun, but anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was a fantastic uh, start to our proceedings. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Sana Karagani. She is Professor of Practice in AI at King's College in London. She's also AI policy lead, res responsible for Responsible AI UK, the £30 million UKRI grant looking into connecting the international AI ecosystem. So over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I can say that I, you're going to hear a lot of the same things that Stephen has just talked about uh, from me. I am going to talk a little bit about what the UK government's AI regulation white paper looked like and the, the, the shortish journey over the last year um, that they've gone on uh, before then releasing uh, earlier this month the response to that white paper. So this is just kind of... A, a showcase of the journey. So the regulation white paper was released in July of 2023. There was the AI Safety Summit, which has already been referred to. Um, that happened at Bletchley Park in November. And then earlier this month, the government released the response to the AI governance white paper. So we'll go through all of these. But I want to specifically touch on how the UK has set out to regulate AI and the speaker after me will be talking about how other regions and locations and countries are, are doing the same thing, um, which is slightly different to our approach. So I think that the, the UK, we, when this was being set out, um, and I should say I was, I was part of government, I was running the, I was head of the office for AI when we came up with the ideas behind the AI regulation white paper. And one of the main ideas behind it was that we have an incredibly rich regulatory landscape here in the UK, which covers the landscape. And they are experts in their area. And I, I, you heard from Stephen earlier, um, the ICO has been leading the charge and leading the way on thinking about um, all of the, the fuel into AI, and there are other many other regulators who are looking at the applications of AI, how it manifests within that. So when we set out looking at how do we want to regulate AI in the UK, we looked at this and said, what needs to happen is we need to be spending a lot more time with the regulators themselves. Um, there are obviously a, a, a huge number of challenges, um, and, and Stephen talked about some of this. So there is a real lack of clarity on who owns what and where does, where does a specific answer to a regulation, regulatory question when it comes to AI sit. There are overlaps, and these are necessary overlaps between the, the regulatory landscape. There is some levels of inconsistency between how the different uh, regulators are approaching similar problems or whose remit it might be 
And I should just stress, this is when the regulation, regulation white paper was coming out. There has been a huge amount of movement on, on getting this fixed since then. And there were gaps. There were many, many gaps that we needed to fix. So what the UK was looking for, and there was a lot of conversation in this about the word pro-innovation. Right? And I think some, some context around this would be important. Um, you cannot have adoption of these technologies without appropriate regulation in place. There will be no innovation in companies if you don't have the right regulation in place because nobody feels safe to do so. Nobody wants to take the risk or the liability um, or the culpability of, of being the person who made a change without the regulator on their side. And we saw some of this early on with um, the, uh, the finance sector where we had to create financial sandboxes for, for movement and innovation to happen in that state. Similarly here, what we were looking for is how do we put in place the right guardrails in order to allow innovation to happen and adoption of AI technologies to happen. And we wanted this to be context specific. So again, how do we ensure that we're looking at the applications and where those applications land within a specific uh, domain and specific sector. We wanted it to be risk-based, which it is also the same as what the AI Act in the EU is doing. We wanted it to be coherent, so it needs to be simple, clear, predictable, and we wanted it to be proportionate and adaptable. So rather than coming in hard with rules and regulations right off the bat, we wanted to be working hand in hand. Government wanted to be working hand in hand with the regulators to try and figure out what is the right way to approach these questions. Um, and lastly, we wanted there to be a coordinate this to be a coordinated effort, so that there was a real understanding uh, about where something ended and where something else began, but also that. Uh, regulators such as the ICO could help regulators that were less far along the journey to come along and understand kind of the learnings that they have had so far. So we created the, the Digital Regulation DRC, the Digital Regulation Coordination Forum. I should write it down because it's a it, it, the acronym blows my mind um, to to help keep that together. And then the core principles. So, so Stephen went through this, rattled these off really quickly. I've got them written down here. So this is about ensuring AI is used safely, ensuring that it is technically secure and, and functions that is designed to do what it says on the tin, um, that it's transparent and explainable, it considers fairness, um, it, there is a, a, a person who is responsible, there is, a, a, there is responsibility, um, and there is routes to redress and contestability. None of this was done in a vacuum. This was done hand in hand with consultation with the ICO and uh, many other regulators that helped create the AR regulation white paper, as, a lot, as well as many of the organizations that are sitting in this room or online. Um, so that paper came out and it had a lot of responses. So here is the, the kind of responses that government got. I should also say, I uh, then was no longer here. So I, I cannot speak for government post this slide. <laughs> but I can, I can now tell you a little bit about uh, what came out in, the, in, the response, in government's response to the white paper. Um, so these are the responses that government received. Alongside these, government also had the safety summit uh, in, in Bletchley Park, which also affected the, the kind of routes the government would be taking going forward in terms of how they might address things, what they will be looking at in terms of uh, the augmentation of national security lists based on AI and so on, um, and, and funding towards the AI safety summit. So, the, the main things that have come out in the government's response to the AI regulation white paper is a lot of the things that, that you've heard already from Stephen. So uh, the regulators are upskilling, they're moving forward very quickly, they're coordinating and working together, they're addressing a lot of the, the gaps, both in knowledge but also in, in kind of systemically how they're addressing um, the risks that are approaching. There's been a huge amount of funding that has been promised by government um, for both the regulators and into the, the AI Safety Institute itself. So we now sit in a place, oh, there's also, I should mention, a, a great number of questions um, that government continues to have and needs help 
our help to solve. Um, and so a lot of areas where institutions of people that uh, your institutions that you're representing here tonight can help them address. So if you haven't read it, please do read the response to the white paper. It sets out the, the kinds of areas where the government still has questions about how to make the next um, step. Um, I should also, just as a, as a final thing, um, nod to the broader ecosystem outside of the, um, the, the AI regulation landscape, which includes um, the Alan Turing Institute working alongside our standards agencies, as well as the UK government to create the AI Standards Hub. So this has been going on now for about a year and a half. But it is, um, when I was there, we did a pilot, um, and it was a very successful pilot. It is now well up and running, um, and it's a wonderful thing that we have as part of our arsenal. We also have the AI Assurance Roadmap that has had a number of iterations as well. So this is a, a whole area of work that needs to be thinking about once we get regulation right, how do we make sure it's actually doing what it says? How do we assure that things are happening? So this is a whole other area of work. Um, and yeah, so that's essentially, other than AI regulation, there are these two other sections that are worth remembering. Um, Cosmina next is gonna talk a little bit about Europe's approach, but I think for me, as a, as a last word, um, I kind of think of AI regulation as this big monolithic thing, and we need to start somewhere. Uh, the UK has started on the application side, the EU is starting from a different side, and the US is coming in and looking at the kitchen sink. Um, there is plenty of work to be done across this. It doesn't matter where we start. I suspect the answer will be somewhere in the middle. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, and our third speaker, indeed following on from those excellent presentations, is Dr. Cosmina Dorobantu. She is policy fellow in the Public Policy Program and co-director at the Alan Turing Institute. We're very grateful to her for joining us. And she is, of course, a member of the government's Regulators and AI Working Group and also part a member of the Bank of England and Financial Conduct Authority's AI Public Private <coughs> Forum. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. Um, look, this is a tremendously exciting time to be alive. And for those of us who have thought about regulation for a while, the mere fact that we can get a room like this tonight with, uh, with, by including the word regulation in the title of the event <laughs> is extraordinary. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> um, but it is an extraordinary, amazing time to be alive because some of the brightest minds in the world have been thinking about this. And it is very hard. We don't have the answers yet. We're just at the very, very, very beginning of this journey. But what's exciting about these days is that we're seeing the first sort of steps in the real world. We've had the publication of the UK's response, uh, which, is, which is amazing to see. And the EU AI Act is um, approaching uh, and ready for prime time uh, itself. And it is my job today to take you on a journey through uh, the continent um, and tell you a little bit about the EU AI Act and the points of intersection with the UK's approach. Um, so um, the EU AI Act classifies AI systems according to risk. Now, we have minimal risk AI systems, which the EU claims uh, are the majority of AI applications that are currently available in the single market, such as AI-enabled video games and spam filters, and they're free to function uh, as they are in the union, so we don't need to worry about those. Then we have limited risk AI systems. Um, and here, the example that was initially given was chatbots, but that was updated to basically say it will not apply to ChatGPT and others <laughs> like it, <laughs> which now fall under another sort of uh, little bit that was added to the, to the act. They're subject to lighter transparency obligations. So basically, developers and deployers must ensure that end users are aware that they're interacting with AI. 
Now, if you ever uh, look at the EU AI Act, the vast, vast, vast majority of the text is about high-risk AI systems. Uh, there's an awful lot of detail on how these systems, uh, how a system might be classified as high risk, and also, once that system is classified uh, as high risk, um, what AI providers uh, must uh, do. Um, uh, and look, I won't go through the list of what they're going to do, but uh, you, can, you, you can find it. <laughs> it is quite long. And finally, uh, there are unacceptable um, risk AI systems, such as social scoring systems, uh, which are just prohibited uh, from the union altogether. This is my quickest, quickest, quickest introduction that I can give you to uh, what is ultimately what a close to 800 page document. Um, but um, I want you to think a little bit about the fact that, you know, you might hear some buzzwords and some of you uh, would have heard them by now that describe the European approach to AI regulation. One of them is that it is rules based. Uh, so there are new rules which establish obligations for providers and users depending on the level of risk. The other one is the fact that it introduces new legislation um, and with the new legislation it also introduces heavy penalties. So non-compliance with the rules will lead to fines ranging from 7.5 million or 1.5% of global turnover to 35 million or 7% of global turnover, depending on the infringement and the size of the company. Now keep in mind that for a company like Google or Microsoft, 7% of global turnover can, can actually be in the billion. So, so that, that's quite a, quite a hefty fine. And also, you'll hear about horizontal uh, legislation. Um, and horizontal legislation uh, basically means that it applies all across um, all the AI systems uh, placed or used within the EU. Now, of course, initially, when the EU was working on this and the UK was working uh, on their approach, um, it made it seem like there were diametrically opposed uh, approaches to AI regulation. So to EU's rules-based approach, uh, we have the UK's principles-based approach, um, and we've already heard about the five core principles that underpin the UK's approach to AI regulation. There's no new legislation introduced uh, in, the, in the UK. Uh, and also, the country is going for what we call a vertical approach, where we're relying on the expertise of existing regulators and their deep sectoral knowledge um, to tailor the implementation of the principles to the specific context where the AI system is used. Now, I want to challenge that a little bit, uh, because how, however different these two approaches seem, I do think that there are points of overlap and intersection. And as time goes on and we hear more about those approaches, I think they're converging a little bit more um, towards something uh, that is common. So if you look at the two first two columns, the rules-based and the principles-based, there's actually a common denominator be, uh, behind these two, which is that both approaches are risk-based, and the level of, level of risk is actually sort of the sliding scale that determines um, the extent to which uh, the, the provisions apply. When we're looking at new legislation in the EU and no legislation in the UK, um, the UK is actually signaling in its documents that legislation might follow. Uh, and what the, the government's white paper says is we will not put these principles on a statutory footing initially. So that does not mean the legislation will not come in this country. And finally, uh, this is something that we guessed from the very beginning would happen. A horizontal approach um, misses out on the sectoral nuances and the sectoral approach misses out on the coordination mechanisms of a centralized approach. And so actually, the EU now, despite it going for a horizontal approach, does have, have some sectoral guidance um, in the EU AI Act. And the UK, despite going for a sectoral approach, is building a centralized function uh, to, build, uh, to, to bring all of this together. The other sort of large point of intersection uh, is standards. Um, and I think this matters an awful lot because for the implementation of both approaches, um, uh, both the EU and the UK approach relies quite heavily on, on standards. Now, regardless of what your views are of the UK and the EU and what their relationship should be, this does give me an awful lot of promise. Because ultimately, AI governance and regulation is an area that is in desperate need of international cooperation. 
and AI development and advancement are global issues. And if, we, if countries follow their own path when it comes to AI governance and regulation, not only will this lead to a fragmented and inefficient market, but it also fail to prevent um, current and future harms linked to AI innovation. And our next speaker will actually tell you about how, not just how the EU and the UK come together and overlap on some of those issues, but how the world can come, come together to address these. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a wonderful example of EU-UK convergence. We might try that in a few other areas as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we're next going to hear from Professor Dame Wendy Hall, Regis Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton, where she's also Director of the Web Science Institute. Uh, she is, of course, one of the most well-known voices on AI. She was co-chair of the UK government's AI review back in 2017 and a member of the AI Council. She's been appointed to the United Nations High Level Advisory Board on AI. Wendy, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. I brought my new hip on its first outing to London today, so um, thank you very much. I, I have to say thank you for the introduction. Thank you for this panel. I, I, I also want to thank, I know, I mean, you, we're going to have a fantastic closing talk, but you three have been just brilliant. And I hope that um, you're setting out the case in such a calm and intelligent and uh, informative way that we don't get in the media or from our politicians, I have to say, some of the time. So I, I, haven't, I can't talk to you, we can answer questions later, but so as um, David said, um, I started out doing a review for the UK government in 2017, and um, uh, now the world. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I was very excited last, uh, God, where's the time gone, last year, uh, to be appointed to the United Nations High Level Advisory Body on Artificial Intelligence, which is... I should stress that this only has a year's... We are not an expert body set up for forever. This is a year's commission to... Um, uh, really, it's aimed at the UN's Summit for the Future, Future Summit in September, and their Global Technology Compact, that um, uh, this AI, our AI report will feed into all that. Uh, they take, the UN's taking this very seriously about how it can help um, govern, convene, coordinate um, AI uh, at a global level for the benefit of everybody. And that's what I like about, we so often sit in rooms like this where we're talking about AI benefiting the UK, the US, Europe, maybe China, and actually basically the tech companies. And um, we don't talk about what it means for the, for the rest of the world and the world that isn't here, the world that hasn't been included in these debates. And for all of you who know me, I've been, I've been part of the development of the internet and the web for a long time, and we didn't get that right. And we have, a lot of it's right, it works across the world, but, but um, so many people are excluded from uh, what happens on the internet, and we've, bad things have happened in the name of openness. And we mustn't, we mustn't repeat history for AI, we must learn from those lessons and move on. So that's part of my um, uh, passion piece here. And this is the timeline, just to, to emphasize that we started, they called for experts in August, we started in October. I remember it was my birthday and I was on a cruise in the Mediterranean and they called the first meeting and I joined in, of course you do. And um, uh, um, they said, um, we're going to produce an interim report before Christmas. Oh. <laughs> and we have. Um, and I, we're led by Amandeep Gill, who is the um, UN tech envoy. And the Secretary General does come to the meetings. He, we, there was a meeting in New York, which I couldn't get to because of my operation, but, but he was there most of the time, despite the fact the talks about Israel and Gaza were going on down the corridor and he's, he'll be in Geneva in two weeks' time when we're there. Um, and so you, there's an interim report. I'm just going to talk briefly about that. 
That's out for consultation. We've been here all afternoon talking about this report. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Royal Society, giving feedback. And by the summer, we're supposed to produce our final report, which it will not be, a, like people have said, it will not answer all the questions. It will be a, a way forward and suggest ways forward that clearly have got to be, as well as sort of like this rather top-down approach, it's got to come from bottom up as well. So um, there'll be a lot, I don't know how, we, I'll say our commission finishes, I don't know yet how it will go forward, um, about other than being discussed in September in New York at their summit of the future. And the Secretary General's key issue is reframing the sustainable development goals in terms of how AI can help towards those. But um, I just want to make the point that the wonderful thing for me about this, it is truly global. Uh, not every country is represented. There's 39 of us um, on uh, members. But I co-chair the governance working group with Yi Zhang from China, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I think that's <laughs> fantastic. Because it's just like climate change. You can't talk about this stuff without having the other country that's doing all the development has as, and worries as much about ethical principles in, some, in a completely different cultural context to, uh, to us. And so it's great to be co-chairing with him. Now, you won't be able to read this, but you can look at... Well, you might be able to. These, there are 39 members, and if you, look, if you just look um, on the web at the list, um, um, it is incredibly diverse, much more diverse than a, a group than I'm used to being in. Um, diverse in 50% you know, women, but also countries across the world. A lot of countries from what we loosely call the Global South, a lot of people from countries in the Global South, um, and uh, including rep two reps from China, a lady from Russia, and um, an incredible rep uh, representation from, that's the, the second half, uh, people. And all these people are experts in AI. So we think, you know, we're the owners of this. And they all have different, they come from different perspectives, but they all, or every one of them, I'm, it's wonderful networking, I'm meeting the most amazing people, and they all have something to say about AI, and I'm learning so much from them, and that's why I'm passionate about it. Now, this all happened the week before, I just, this is just the chronology, the week before the safety summit, and I was um, one of the very few people who actually got a ticket. Right, there were like four professors from the UK there, something like that, and it was so weird. I didn't understand why it had to be quite so secretive on the day that had nothing to do with secrets. Actually, it was, although we've gone a rather, maybe we can talk about it later, I think the UK has gone a, down a bit of a rabbit hole with AI safety, but we'll talk about that later maybe. But um, the, the summit actually was because a lot of the UN advisory board people were there because they were the people, the countries that were invited to the summit, their UN, their UN advisory, we were all, we were all um, put forward by our home countries, although I don't represent the UK on the UN board, but we weren't nominated by our countries. And, and um, so a lot of the UN people were at it. And so, so it, was, it was actually a very diverse summit in many ways. Um, and then there were sort of three levels. This was the, I was very impressed because we, that was the Secretary of State in the US, our Secretary of State and the Vice President of China. I thought that was a great, you know, we were, it was inclusive in that sense. These are the people that talk behind closed doors and these are the people that were not allowed to be taught behind closed doors. Uh, these are all pictures off the web of, of how it, it was a bit weird. But the summit, the discussions at the summit itself, I didn't get to go to any of the second day. I was at the day when... Um, uh, uh, they, they had the opening day on the first um, but the, the, the discussions around uh, the working groups were actually very useful and then we at that summit introduced uh, said we're going to run another one in Korea and then oh we won't but the Koreans are going to have one France are going to have one we're going to carry on with these summits I don't know what's going to happen to them and they um, as San has already said we set up the AI Safety Institute and um, you know, there's a lot of... So countries like us and the US, EU, the EU, China are doing things. And how is that all going to bubble up to the, um, what the UN is going to do? So um, we we would, I would recommend you look at this. Our report that was released is open in December, just before Christmas, um, that uh, it's open for consultation. It is a draft. 
As I say, we've been sitting here all afternoon with a group of experts talking about feedback from, that will come from the Royal Society and RAI UK and um, to this. And uh, this is the, the sort of governance functions that the, um, are suggested in, uh, in the report as a, as a driver for discussion. And the key thing I want to just finish with is this very simple slide. I tried to think of a picture, but I'm not very good at that. Um, we have to, this is the, the, the UN report is about the governance, and you've got governance regulation standards, all different things. They're very, very interrelated, but they are different things. And governance, what is the UN going to, what can a UN, it won't necessarily be a UN agency. And in the report, we discuss the types of organisations you might set up. There's no obvious example candidate out there, but the types of organisations that you might set up to govern AI at a global level. And what, what would it actually try to do? And how would it police it? I mean, how is it going to govern it? How is it going to manage it? So um, I think it's got to, we've got to keep it very simple. Regulation will happen in the nation states, but it's all... I think yeah, we can talk later, you can give me feedback about what a, an overall governance could be, but it's more about coordinate, convening, coordinating principles. And the detail, the legal stuff will happen in nation states, and then you've got the standards which permeates all, through all of that and has to be also agreed um, globally in order to work. So uh, that's my last slide. That's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about in Geneva in two weeks' time. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you very much in, indeed, Wendy, and a very useful review and a very important set of distinctions on which to end. Uh, our final speaker is John Gibson. He is the Chief Commercial Officer at Faculty, a leading AI, applied AI company. Before uh, joining Faculty, he worked inside government, including in the Prime Minister's Policy Unit. He's on the board of Innovate UK. Very warm welcome to John Gibson. Hi everyone. Uh, I suppose, I suppose that as the uh, private sector representative on this panel, my job is to grumble about regulations and com complain that Stephen's killing everybody's fun. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I think that um, Sana was exactly right when she said that without good regulation, no innovation happens. Sort of no business activity happens. Um, but I am going to say that I think it's, it's really important that this debate around how we regulate AI adopts the right posture towards the subject. And as Wendy said, the kind of wider debate in the media and sometimes in policymaking circles as well um, doesn't always do that. I think it's really important that we make sure that we don't think of AI as some sort of external threat that we have only limited control over that we want to sort of mitigate and manage like inflation or climate change or something like that. Um, but rather that our sort of starting point is to take it as an incredibly important technology um, that we do, at least as we stand, have total control over, which if we get right, could solve a lot of problems in our society, create a lot of good, deliver changes to sort of well-being and productivity at a scale and at a speed that we're just not used to. So in that regard, I think it's important we, we, we start with that as our premise and that regulators uh, see their role in this as being to accelerate the adoption of the technology and to make sure that it has a kind of soft landing into society, that it delivers the good that it can deliver um, without creating the sort of harms that can happen um, if it's not well managed. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of nuance to that position. And I think uh, the best way to um, unpack it is to um, define a bit of a space that looks something like this. Um, so if you take on the y-axis, you have the capability of a system. And then on the sort of x-axis, you have how general it is. Um, you can see up there a chess computer. It's extremely good at one thing, but it only does one thing. Um, and then you take a human, and they're probably most humans are probably not as good as chess computers at chess. 
um, but they're very general machines that can do very many things at once. And I've sort of drawn a rough red line on the top right region of that space. And I think that really the regulatory debate to me should be about defining the space and then figuring out what we can do to accelerate the stuff that happens on the left-hand side of the red line, while also being pretty cautious about the things that might happen on the right-hand side of the line. Um, and so just to sort of further unpack that a little bit, I think the sort of left-hand side of the line is basically narrow models. We'll call them narrow models for now, the right-hand side of the line, general models. And I think in terms of narrow models, um, there's broadly speaking two scenarios that have different consequences for how um, I think they should be regulated. Uh, you've basically got narrow models used by good actors and narrow models used by bad actors. And in the case of narrow models by good actors, what we're talking about here is just um, organizations up and down the country using AI to make their business run better in some way. And the thing that we need to safeguard is to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences to the good faith actions that people are taking. Um, and this, in a sense, is the simplest area, I think, to, uh, to consider from a regulatory perspective. Um, I think the objective in this regard should be to speed up implementation. Um, and this is where the sort of, I think, the vertical approach that has been adopted in the UK, so that's focusing on the existing regula regulators as they stand, um, is the right one. Um, and as Stephen said earlier, a lot of this isn't new. This is a series of potential harms that we know about already, um, and just new ways of, uh, I guess, creating those harms that need to be sort of carefully managed as you adopt the new technology. Um, the one carve out to that position in this kind of narrow models, good actors thing, is in autonomous weapons, which I think sort of deserves a category on its own. Um, I know there was an awful lot of debate around this for a very long time, but it strikes me that in Ukraine, it's sort of just happening in front of our eyes. Um, we have those, uh, what are they called, SACAR drones um, that may or may not be acting autonomously in the field and delivering explosive payloads to people without humans in the loop. Um, it feels like that's a Rubicon crossed. It doesn't feel like that's getting the sort of debate it perhaps requires. Um, it's quite a scary technology, not least because of the risk that that technology is taken by sort of terrorists and people who want to do harm out of the battlefield and into cities and so on. Um, which I guess leads into the, the sort of second area of, uh, of this space, which is narrow models, bad actors. And I think here there's some more novel issues um, that require a, a bit more thought and that might need a different regulatory uh, setup. I'm not sure that the sort of vertical regulation is, is the right way to get here. And so we sort of have an emerging sense of the contours of some of these risks. Um, we'll all have heard about deep fakes, um, cyber attacks being automated, misinformation at scale, and so on. So we sort of, we're starting to see what this looks like. But I actually think there's a, a sort of a more general position on this, which is, um, which is something of a hole in the regulatory landscape at the moment. And so if you take a step back from it all, um, what AI in general, generative AI most recently uh, can do is deliver gigantic improvements in uh, productivity. And so if you're a nurse, if you're a software developer, if you're a copywriter, if you're a doctor, um, we're seeing studies come out that say it's 20% or 30% or 40% or 50% more efficient to do your job if you use this technology. And they're the goodies. In principle, the technology can also enhance the baddies' ability to do the things they want to do. But the mechanisms that are in place to prevent that happening today are basically the safety training of the models that are out there in the world. And so roughly, roughly, the way that you create one of these models is um, you train the model, you feed it more or less all the information on the internet, you teach it to understand language, you then have something that is very, very powerful and that will answer any question you ask it without regard to any criterion of morality. Then you do a safety training layer that sits on top of it and you constrain the model. So if you start to ask it bad things like, I want to go and shoot up my school, how do I kill the most number of people without getting caught, it won't give you an answer. Okay, so that's how these models at the moment are delivered into the world in a way that prevents them from causing harm. Now, inside the servers of OpenAI, somewhere, there is a copy of uh, every version of the pre-safety trained model. Uh, it exists, and if you ask that model to do terrible things, it will tell you how to do them, it will tell you how to do them much better. Um, LLMs, these large models, have leaked 
from these large research labs in the past. There's a model called Llama. It's one of the biggest open source models out there now. That was originally leaked from Facebook. Um, if a model like that leaks and makes it onto the dark web, then there's no reason why all of the criminals in the world can't access the 20, 30, 40, 50% increase in their productivity uh, that coders and copywriters and doctors and teachers and so on are accessing now, and the world doesn't need that. Okay, so that I think is an interesting area which is currently um, a void in the regulations. The EU Act with its horizontal um, approach starts to address issues like this, but they have reserved the powers to demand um, security standards for how you store those models for the most general systemic models as they describe them. In my view, they need to drop the threshold there a little bit and cover a larger number of models in that space. So that's, uh, that's the space to the left of the red line, the sort of narrow models. And then when you get into the sort of space to the right of it, the much more general models, I think in any scenario where the probability of AGI is greater than zero, um, that's something that needs to be taken very seriously and treated differently. I think you can hold that position without taking too strong a view of what that probability is. But as long as it's greater than zero, um, I think we need, to, I think we need to, to take it seriously. Now, interestingly, the EU has drawn a line that looks a bit like this in their act, um, but it's somewhat to the left of sort of my notional line up here. And it covers models that are about as sophisticated as GPT-4. They define it according to uh, how much computation was used in training. And accordingly, the regulatory regime they've placed around that is proportionate to that kind of model. But I think what that creates is a bit of a gap between the capabilities of those models and the capabilities of models to come that start to approach anything that looks like AGI. And I think it's important to sort of recognize that in a world where we do create AGI, it's almost certainly the most consequential technology we've ever invented as a species. And it has the potential to have very profound consequences for us that no one can really understand. There isn't really any analogy we can draw to other technologies uh, from history, which makes it sort of quite hard to uh, sort of to reason about. But there are some precedents from sort of technologies that we consider to be um, sort of important and harmful. So for example, human cloning is banned. You could just ban it. Um, I don't actually think that's the right approach in this case, but I, I do think you could mount an argument to say that AGI would be more consequential than human cloning, so there's, you know, there's something there to be explored. Um, there are other technologies like precursors to uh, biological or nuclear weapons where access is heavily restricted, um, and I think that's the kind of thing you could start to see happening here. So you could imagine the most powerful GPU chips uh, start to be subject to access regulations I actually think that's likely to happen, would be my guess. I think that's likely to happen in the next decade or so. Um, and a, a sort of a final thought on this, which I'll leave you with, um, is that there's a sort of an area that Sanna talked about briefly around AI assurance, which I think is um, underexplored in the regulatory world. Um, one of the big problems we have with the technology that sits in the top right there is that we basically fundamentally don't understand how these models work or how to control them. And so as they get more and more powerful, that becomes problematic. Um, there is a, an emergent field of research, which is referred to as AI safety. It sounds like Wendy might have slightly different views on this to me, but uh, there's an emergent field of research called AI safety, which I think is very important. How do we build the technologies and the tools that allow us to interrogate and understand and control these models? And I think there's a sort of a gap in the regulatory space at the moment for mandating that the people who are building these sort of deep foundation models um, invest their time and their resources in this kind of research in some proportion to the amount of money they're spending building the underlying technology and that they sort of apply them according to, to governed standards to make sure that we, are, we have the technological means at our hands uh, to stay in control. And so I will, I'll leave things there. I'll leave things there on that sort of fairly uh, doomy gloomy note. Thanks everyone. Good. Well, what um, fascinating presentations. Um, I should just say, I've had one or two messages from the online participants and saying that the slides were rather blurred. I'm sorry if they weren't. 
easy to see. They will be up on our website uh, tomorrow morning. And do, of course, for our online participants, use the Q&A function. Um, I thought, actually, something you said, Wendy, might just be a first question to the panellists, and then I'll turn to the hall. Uh, you said, almost in passing, you thought the UK safety, AI safety agenda had gone down a bit of a rabbit hole. Right. And we I'm had some about. calm, rational explanations of how this was all developing. So tell us what you meant by that, and let's get... OK, so I agree with John that this sort of research is really, really important. It's good research, fabulous. Um, but the, 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 it, they, where the UK's gone with it is that exclusive of everything else. It feels like it. The Office for AI is growing. It's huge now, and I uh, don't really... You know, not 100% certain what they all do. But the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, no, and that's not true. I mean, they work very hard. I know they do, right? And it, but it's the, when I say 100% certain, it's like, what is happening in the in DSIT with the Office of AI? But also with the AI, and I get briefings from the AI Safety Institute. The work they're doing is fantastic. But it, um, so my question is, where is it going to go? Because um, uh, really, and I think you said it, John, mm. that sort of development, the, the companies should be paying for, actually. You know, if you had... Um, when you took a think about the drugs industry, they develop the drugs, they do the evaluation and the testing, and then the regulator steps in. Yeah. And um, so I worry about the relationship between the AI Safety Institute, the companies, and what the British taxpayer is getting out of it. Right. <laughs> um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask a whole panel. That was a very interesting chat. But I don't know if Stephen, as the regulator, you know, there was clearly a regulator, you want to comment on that, and then I will turn to the... Turn to the people here in the hall. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Look, as, as John was, was describing very eloquently, there are very different shaped problems um, in this space. So there are some problems here which are problems of what, yeah, kind of classical regulation, the kind of the right regulation for the good guys. But actually, we, we're starting to drift into problems that are, are of broader governance here. So we're starting to drift into questions that, that feel like almost taxation questions in terms of who should pay for some of the, um, the costs of governing AI. We're talking about things that look rather more like export controls um, than uh, necessarily kind of uh, general binding rules approaches to regulation. I think it's probably uh, natural that we do so, but it's, it's worth us being quite conscious that we're, we're talking about some quite different levers to manage some of these different risks. Right. right. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to that. I hope the rest of the panel will, for, will forgive me. We're going to collect some interventions from here. We'll probably collect several. And let's start towards the front. I see two or three hands around the front. Yep. And then we'll collect... Yep. Yep. So, uh, if you could give your name and organisation, uh, Doug Kell, University of Liverpool. So, uh, the exam question, as written, is a somewhat binary one, and my question is: uh, Should we have some special cases? And the particular special case I have in mind for liberal democracies is the periods preceding elections in which I think we all know what happened with Cambridge Analytica and Brexit, et cetera, et cetera. No generative AI involved. This is data mining was behind all of that. And, I, and in France, for instance, you're not allowed to have a poll in the week before uh, a general election because cephalologists know that this will influence the, the votes and so forth. So my proposal is to the panel to have a thought as to whether or not we should have very special kinds of regulation in the periods preceding elections. Right, interesting ideas. And straight ahead, yep. Thank you. Uh, excellent panel. Uh, my point is triggered by what John said at the end there. Uh, seven years ago, I was at the Commonwealth Science Conference in Singapore, and there was a session there on public perception of AI, uh, chaired by Lord Rees of this house. And in summing up, he said, if there's one thing more dangerous than artificial intelligence, it's real stupidity. <laughs> and I, I, I agreed with him then, I agree with him now. <laughs> to, to John's point about how you control this, I, I think it strikes me that if artificial intelligence is good enough, then it's capable of controlling itself. Yeah, AI can exactly. be both the mm -hmm. gamekeeper as well as the poacher, mm -hmm. and I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. We're going to carry on collecting a couple of interventions along the front, and do give your name and organisation as well, please. Uh, Errol Gelenby. Uh, I'm a professor at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, my question is actually about the approach that we're taking both in Europe and in the UK. Uh, 
uh, we are actually aiming towards a, an intelligence which is comparable to a human intelligence. Uh, shouldn't we be wondering uh, what kind of personality could be defined around this intelligence rather than about how they should be regulated? I mean, as human beings, uh, we're going to find another entity which is quite comparable to us. It's not going to be technology. It's going to be decision-making. It's going to have opinions. It's going to tell us what we should be doing. They will have different opinions and so on. And how do we deal with that? I think that's the fundamental question rather than one of regulating things as the technology grows. Okay. We have got a subject for this evening, which we are trying to focus on. Yeah, next. Thank you. Um, Nick, on the um, PRO. Um, my, my question is, um, how, we're hearing all this regulation, UK, US, the EU, but what's stopping a, let's say, a bad actor in the UK going and using an AI tool which is based in Greenland, which is doing sort of social scoring, or even a life science company wants to go to the same sort of, you know, Greenland base platform, which is a bit more fast and loose with, with personal data than regulators in the UK or the EU um, are, are, are comfortable with. Thank you. I'm going to start with Sana and then Cosmina, because you gave, and it was a, this is a compliment, this is a good thing, you gave a sort of calmly rational account of structures of regulation, but there are all these kind of turbulent, insurgent, speculations about the technology. How does it all slot into your regulatory regime? Do you want to start first? Sam? Well, thank you very much, because these were really easy questions, so I'm glad to be going first. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I think I'm, I'm not, I, I may not touch on everybody's questions directly, but just to pick up on a couple of things that, that um, stood out for me. So one a little bit about how do we create the future we want to move into, right? Um, and I think that, that or, or, or indeed the kind of AI that we, we want to have, um, I think that falls really nicely into the Responsible AI UK program and what we're building, which is, which is less um, what John described as in let's build the LLM and then, you know, the large language model and then afterwards we'll put some safety stuff on top of it and make sure that, you know, it does what we actually want. It's more about how do we design a thing that we understand and know what it's going to go and do, um, rather than just throwing all of the intelligence and power we have and then sitting back and seeing what happens. Um, being kind of, you know, following, following the, the engineering principles that we all know so well, to design responsibility in from the outset. So I, I think that falls really nicely into what we're trying to do with Responsible AI UK, which is about bringing kind of solution owners and challenge owners together, which is sector experts, experts that, are, that have expertise in a certain area with people who are in, in informatics and, and AI and saying, you know, let's, let's solve solutions that actually are targeted to a, a challenge. So that's one there. And then just to, just to very quickly talk about the, how, do we, how are we stopping people from going somewhere that's a bit faster and looser with um, their regulation, I think this falls squarely into the work that Wendy is doing um, in the UN, which is what, what we have realized, and I think right ahead of the, the um, AI Safety Summit, what became very prevalent um, was that this isn't a set of technologies that sits within our within one country's borders, or in fact will you know abide by one jurisdiction. These are technologies, and and the reason they've gotten so much attention is because they uh, go live in one place, and all of a sudden, you know, within within three days, have a hundred million users across the world. So. These are technologies that we need to necessarily require international governance and, and a, a, a conversation to either agree or at least have a set of interoperable rules and regulations that everybody signs up to. And that is because this is a challenge that's bigger than any individual country. And it's one that needs all of us to come together. Yeah, thank you. And you think that... Uh to take the extreme case, that for China, this is something you can imagine China and the US agreeing a regulatory framework? I mean, I'm, uh, as, as everyone else, I was incredibly um, pleased to see that China came to the table at, to the AI Safety Summit and indeed signed the declaration alongside everyone else. Um, I think 
like like climate change, when it comes to some of these questions, they're bigger than any individual country. Um, and so I guess my, my kind of optimism or hope is that yes, they come together and do this because it's not, it's not just about the politics, this is the scientists and science will prevail. Thank you. There's a, that's the kind of thing you hear at the Royal Society. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, Cosmina, your interpretation. Um, it's super. Um, just on the first question on elections, uh, look, there's, you know, so much of the world is voting this year, uh, and there is so much interest in uh, uh, the intersection of AI and elections, um, and rightfully so. Sadly, this interest is going to die the day after the election, but I think before that we can have a lot of informed debate about it, uh, and lots of people are going to want to hear it. Um, we've done a little bit of work at the Turing to look at this. Um, We've tried to see how much, uh, you know, how much sort of personalized messages from a large language model can persuade the voter. It turns out that they don't do a very good job, but what they do an incredibly good job at is finding sort of the common message that goes out to all the voters and that perform better than any other human. Um, on public perception of AI, uh, and perhaps this is linked to, to, to democracy, I do think we need to speak more to the public as to what they want. Um, and we have uh, run a survey, uh, rep a representative survey here within the UK on public uh, attitudes to AI. We've asked the public about regulation. It turns out that a lot of them do actually want regulation. Though interestingly, uh, what type of regulation they want differs by their age. So young people believe that the developers should be policing the space and the companies should be responsible for it. Older people believe that the regulators should be stepping in. Oh. On the um, what personality we should define around AI, so that's a great question. Um, my instinct is also always to be very careful around language, and I don't actually like the term artificial intelligence. And there was a time when we were thinking of, uh, of calling them complex information processing systems, and I think that would have been a much, much better word to use. <laughs> um, and I think some of the controls that we have Not around quite this... quite so catchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some of, the, the, some of the, the, the problems that come from those systems um, is that you do talk to ChatGPT, for example. It seems quite convincing. It says... I believe, you know, I, I think. I, I mean, it doesn't believe anything. It doesn't think anything. Whatever he has learned, he has learned from the data that we put in, into it. Um, it is not a, a, a moral being who believes of its own. And finally, on the bad actor question, uh, it, look, that will, uh, it's not just in, that will happen everywhere. And I think regardless of the regulations that we have, another huge, huge topic for us to consider is implementation. So um, even with, within the EU, you know, you can look at it and say, look, there's this, you know, horizontal um, approach. There's a common legislation. There are penalties and so on. There's an AI office that they're setting up in Brussels uh, with huge effort. It's not easy to set up new offices in Brussels. <laughs> um, and, um, and yet... Who is going to be responsible for the implementation within each country? Well, the countries themselves have been asked to, to decide on their own. They can build their own AI regulator. They can sort of give this responsibility to their data protection agency. And, you know, if you look at the sort of, you know, array of countries within the EU, if you believe that each one of those countries are going to be policing this legislation equally, well, uh, I think you're in for a surprise. <laughs> Now, I'm, and, and I'm gonna, because we've got five panellists and a lot of questions, unless any of our panellists are determined, I'm going to collect another round. And, of course, if there's something here, and we'll start at the back this time. Um, and let's see, and then I'll start by the panellists who've not contributed this time. Yes, yes, that's right, in that round. <coughs> Do I, give your name and organisation. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, my name's Joseph Bambridge from uh, Politico. Um, Stephen, as the, the regulator on the panel... I have a question for you. Are you prepared if you were to find, let's say, a, uh, an open AI model or a SNAP model, are you prepared to tell those companies uh, that they would have to unpick um, any kind of violations, retrain their models, for example? And if I can sneak in a kind of follow-up, are you also, um, do you feel the ICOs uh, equipped to also challenge any um, inappropriate uses of AI within government. Obviously, 
this government has made it clear they're very keen on facial recognition technology and other uses of AI. Um, and in the context of the data bill, curious. Right. Okay. That. Thank you very, very much. Good. And then immediately behind you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, Peter Marsh, made here now. Um, uh, th th thank you very much uh, for that list of principles from uh, Sana about the principles of the UK government in, in regulating AI. And they all sound very sensible, but I think they hide perhaps some levels of complexity that r really d do become problematic, um, w one being um, transparency and fairness. Well, who, who decides on the fairness on, and, and the transparency? Some of the companies who you're trying to regulate probably don't want you to dig too far down into their models to find out precisely what they're capable of. The other one is safety. I mean, if, yeah. if you're trying to regulate the, uh, for uh, a company, again, who's designing um, a ballistic missile systems that's designed to blow people up, I mean, by definition, they're trying to be safe for the people pressing the button, but they're not safe for the people at the other end of it. And it depends which way around you're looking. And, and these are sort of knotty questions, and I, I know it's very difficult, but perhaps somebody could address that. Yes, and indeed, we've had it online. And let, let's, uh, Gavin, let's move down and collect a couple of interventions across there. I think I see a bunch of three question, hands raised. We'll take those three as well. Yeah. Um, hi, Teresa Dumchen from Global Council. My question wants to expand on um, the thought of malicious actors using AI. I think the AI Act and the AI White Paper do a good job of outlining guardrails for companies and developers. But let's think, for example, someone who is in the incel community, so a misogynist actor, deliberately using data poisoning techniques to manipulate a model into being biased against women. In that case, as I understand the current regulatory framework, the model developers would be um, responsible for the harm that occurs. But shouldn't there also be a criminal law against intentional data poisoning to achieve such a gain? And then looking at this from a more global perspective, maybe to um, Dame Wendy Hall, could, a, could an international organization perhaps um, be an institution which could name and shame harmful use cases of AI by nation states. For example, first reports show that Russia is using AI for disinformation campaigns. Yeah, and um, thank you. Yes, oh. uh, next to you. Yep. Yep. Um, Justin Pennells from Winchester College. Um, thank you very much. It was such, a, such an interesting talk. Um, I was really struck by John, um, your words about unintended consequences. So that's something that is obviously impossible to foresee. Um, they are far less disruptive technologies um, than AI. I mean, the microwave, what, what, there was an observation that it actually changed the family structure because, you know, people are heating up meals individually rather than sort of sitting together and eating. But that's beside the point. Um, but obviously working in education for an edtech startup, um, what are your views on regulation in education? Um, language models they take over writing, and writing is such a formative process for young people. What are you, or what are your views, rather, on how language models should be used, implemented, and regulated in the educational sectors that are going to transform and disrupt um, large, large generations? Right, and then there was another question, I think, in that group. Yeah. Um, hello, uh, Richard Bosky from Infospace. Um, I was invited uh, four months ago to give a, a presentation to the Treasury on AI's impact on financial stability. And one of the points that I realized was the concept of emergent behavior. Uh, financial systems are highly complex internet, internet networks. And then when you have deep models, uh, deep nodes, then in fact it's been raised in the United US as well, you have the issue of uh, un, un, unanticipated emergent behavior. How might that be then regu regulated? Right. Um. I think, Stephen, several of the questions have come to you as a regulator. Let, let's start with you. Um, uh, thank you. What a, what a, a, a delightful set of questions. Um, <laughs> first up, um, uh, is the ICO um, uh, thinking hard about um, uh, the right remedies um, uh, that we should have where, uh, uh, where some of the wrong outcomes are coming out from, from AI that's using personal data? Yes, yes we are. 
Um, uh, yes, that includes um, the standard remedies that people are quite used to us seeing, uh, to us deploying as a data protection regulator, which tends to fall into uh, the camps of either saying, please delete the data that's been gathered by ill-gotten means or fining a firm. But actually, we recognize that in relation to AI, we're going to need a broader and different toolkit. Um, uh, we have already seen the uh, Federal Trade Commission in the US um, uh, use um, uh, model deletion um, as a remedy uh, or, or provide instructions around uh, sort of a class of, um, uh, of approaches which people describe as algorithmic disgorgement, so kind of uh, effectively mm -hmm. kind of re requiring the, uh, the retraining um, uh, of models. I think that is going to be a space that not just we, but potentially other regulators, um, and not just in the UK, but around the world, we will all be drawn towards. And the reasons for that are, are quite simple. Um, and that's because the commercial incentives around lots of the, uh, the practices here are all around the model. Yeah. They're not around the data that it's necessarily been trained on. You can get the data potentially quite easily, but actually the, the, go, the work that's gone into development of the model means that some of our existing toolkit of remedies is not likely to be nearly as effective as we might wish it to be in the future. Um, uh, the, the second question around uh, can we regulate AI use in government, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, the slightly longer answer to that um, uh, is that we are um, uh, clearly set up as an independent regulator of government. We take that very seriously, and it's important, I think, in terms of making sure that there is public trust in the services that are provided by government. And the, the slightly longer answer, again, around this is that we really welcome um, the commitment that's been made by the government in its response to the white paper around adoption of the algorithmic transparency reporting standards, which will mean that actually we have much greater confidence around where AI is being uh, developed and deployed within government and are able to intervene appropriately. Thank you. Um, uh, Wendy, I, I'm going to, to turn to you next. I'm going to add in an extra question, for, which is, because it's about the international development, it's from a professor at London Met who is asking about how developed countries can help those underdeveloped, especially, for example, in Africa, um, and whether the... Uh, national regulation by the big powers will enable it to reach and help developing countries. So I'm throwing that in as well as all the other ones, Wendy, because uh -huh, uh -huh. I know you can handle it. Okay. So I'm going to do the two Ronnie's sketch and answer a question from the first round, but it picks up... Oh, you remember the two Ronnie's sketch? Right. Um, but it picks up on... Uh, I can't remember your name from the Global Council as well. I think it was you. So the, I, I, uh, And then I'll see how I go. But the... Um, you, you talked about special cases and you talked about regulating deep fakes. And this is something I, I and others have been talking about for years, it feels like. And this was another, the, the government went down a very particular rabbit hole and didn't, we were warning last year that all these elections are coming up and you don't need generative AI to produce deep fakes. Right? This is good old fashioned AI. It was earlier than that. It was earlier than last year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just saying it yes. was 2022. Yeah. <laughs> What, we were talking about it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. The paper was earlier. And if we had discussed it more then, with a, what, what laws can we bring in to make things criminal that are obviously criminal? Like if you take someone's image and use it to create a deep fake without their permission or their audio, that should be a criminal act. Now, my, there are lawyers who say it is, but actually when the Sadiq Khan deep fake went around, it was his audio, the police said they couldn't do anything about it because it wasn't a criminal act that that had been created yeah. and used. And I, I thought, God, it must be. And yeah. actually, they were, the police were right. It isn't a criminal act. And we should have brought in this. This is simple legislation to do. When something, and so I think you picked up on this point, didn't you? With, um, and face recognition is another one. Well, this is, this is truly good old-fashioned AI. And you buy the technology in from China. And, and of course it's useful. I mean, we have lots of CCTV cameras and we feel safer for them and the police catch all sorts of criminals and we can follow the terrorists, don't get everybody. But, 
But how, you know, the legislation about how that, that could be used if we're picking up people's faces in crowds, that hasn't been sorted out. But these are the things that we can do now. We don't have to wait for the UN to do something. Or we can bring in these laws now. So I, I'm a great believer in thinking about that rather than the ex worrying too much about the existential threat. As important as it might be, you said, if it's more than zero, we have to worry about it. Yes, we do. Um, but the, I think that, you know, it's, it's actually about creating the building blocks to that. So we don't, you know, that, that, that sort of, and we don't know what AGI is. Someone asked a question about AGI. Can it, you know, if AI is that good, it should be able to govern itself. Well, yes, of course, that's what Stephen Hawkins said. It was one of the last things he said, talked about before he died, was that if we can invent something that's cleverer than us, then that's it, we're lost. That is the, you know, but we haven't got there yet. And what we've got to put in is the, 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 in the structure that enables us to use this technology to our benefit and guard against it becoming a threat. And, and I think we can take some small steps towards that in a practical way, rather than trying to constantly think about the philosophical question, which is really hard to answer about what is an existential threat, what is AGI. Um, but then in terms of what... I really want to talk about generative AI and education, because yeah. the question yeah. about... I mean, I'm a great believer, and I'm, I mean, this is, people say this all the time. Uh, I remember when calculators were brought in and teachers said, over, my, over our dead bodies, will children be able to use calculators in classrooms? Well, we have computers now. I mean, nobody has to do long division by hand anymore if they don't want to. And maybe it's a skill that, But, you know, I think that generative AI, in terms of uh, writing skills, is going to profoundly change education for the good, for the better. Um, and it will help, help all sorts of people who have to summarise huge numbers of documents. Um, and it, it will give us... A, it, will, it will be a, fan, a game changer in many ways. Uh, so I'm, I'm all for being careful, of course, about just like with a calculator, you have, you, have to, you have to learn that the numbers you put in, if, you don't, if the answer doesn't make sense, it, there's a bit of issue. Anyway, I, you're looking at me, I've got to shut up. But the thing about the, you know, you have to, you have to learn to check things and, and use it as a learn to prompt engineer and all these things. You have to learn how to do it. That's part of what we'll teach kids to do and our students at universities. What can the UN, that was a good question about, how can the, a, a, global, a global governance body actually make any difference? And I do think it is about, it may be naming and shaming, and it may be calling out, and it may be uh, reporting, co coordinating, where so if, if there's an agreement on a set of principles where people have broken that. Um, but it will be down to regulation to actually create the laws and put people in prison for breaking those laws. That is not what a global governance body will do. I think, uh, John, do you want to, do you want to come, because you, it was your presentation above all that kind of got us a sense of where we could head and it, what happens if you've got AGI. Do you want to comment on the, uh, to some of these questions? Because there is an underlying concern, which I think you probably captured in your intervention. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the, so there's a few questions that haven't been picked up yet. So. Um, there's one, I think, incredibly important question about um, who decides on transparency and fairness. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and I think it's, it, it's, it's immensely important that the answer to that is democratically elected governments and then the regulators that are their sort of agents enforcing that, because there is a risk that it is not those organizations and it is just the tech companies that build the models. Yeah. And so AI software, uh, to a larger extent than traditional types of software, can embody a world model. Um, and that world model either comes through the data that the model is trained on, um, or it can come through the safety training that models are put through to sort of determine what's right or wrong. On the latter, on the safety training, I don't know, you may or may not have been following it, but there's been a bit of a debate raging over the last few days about Google's latest model called Gemini. Mm -hmm. And the way they've safety trained it is basically just ag aggressively woke. <laughs> um, and so you can ask it questions which sort of touch woke topics, and it gives you a very, very particular perspective that is very noticeable. I won't sort of give, go into examples, but it's very, very noticeable that it's a very woke model. And that's obviously created um, a lot of debate because the world model that they've built into that isn't sort of sort of in the normal Overton window. It's a little bit sort of to the, to the extreme of it, and that has consequences. And they've chosen to do that, and, it's, and maybe that's not so consequential right now when 
uh, Gemini is, in a sense, a demo that people are messing around with. However, when you're starting to get into um, areas like models that are used to make decisions about whether people can access scarce resources, loans, government grants, and so on, um, that's where it does become uh, very important that the, the standards are clearly defined according to the, the way that we as a democracy um, choose to define them, and that the uh, people who build the models and the people who implement them are held to account accordingly. And on that note, I think there is real cause for optimism in this regard, in the sense that models can be biased because they're trained on data that describes the world, and the world sadly is biased. And it's biased because of sort of history and things that we sort of, you know, don't like today. And it's biased because some people are still biased. And so the world is biased, so the, the world creates data, the models trained on the data reflect that bias. But when human decision makers make decisions, that kind of bias can be quite hard to pick up. It can certainly be hard to measure at scale, but you can implement systems that govern the way AI models make decisions that allow you to be very precise about how biased they are and to monitor it and to control for it. So I actually think that in, in this regard, there's, a, there's I have great optimism that we will end sort of 300,000 years of human bias by using machines to basically <laughs> capture to capture it, to record it, and allow us to just manage it more directly than we can Maybe. in just a distributed set of decision makers who are all just sort of doing their own thing. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Uh, these models. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. That's a very interesting interpretation, very optimistic interpretation, and there's no harm in that. Mm -hmm. Cosmina, your observation. Do you want to add anything particularly on what you've just heard? Look, I, I, I think I share some of the optimism. I think. You know, look, our policing systems have been biased for a long time. Um, we do have the opportunity with those technologies to lay some of those biases bare. And I think that matters uh, to be able to understand that. As to whether we're going to be able to correct it in the models, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm more reserved as far as that is uh, that goes. I, I don't think we're there then. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm going to come back to the hall in a moment. And just to, there's a lot of interventions coming in online, and we are covering their topics. There's a, there's a set of concerns about um, being regulated by people who aren't really going to be on the receiving end of some of its most, you might argue, threatening uses, surveillance by machine at work, discrimination by ethnicity or postcode. And this issue of can AI regulation be made more inclusive and equitable, which we've touched on, but I should recall that's a, that's a strand. Um, there is um, also a set of questions about uh, training, what this safety training is going to look like. Is there any uh, for people developing and using AI? And um, there's also a, um, a line of, of questioning about, and I'm going to, Stephen may want to note this because he's an embodiment of this. We, um, what potential is that for independent testing, certification, and assurance of AI services before they enter the market? And perhaps in a moment I'm, you, I might ask you to comment on that. But let's also now co collect some more interventions and questions from. The floor. Um, uh, yes. Oh, there's one. There's a, there's a hand right. Yeah. Next. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Good. There's two there. Yep. Hello there. Uh, my name is Carl Massey. I'm at Serendipity Capital in Singapore. Um, can I ask you a foundational question? Which is, I think we're in a, still in the era where the vast majority of data that's being trained upon is human. Um, we're very soon not going to be in that world. We'll be in a world where the vast majority of data that's available will have been generated by a machine. So to what extent do we have to deal with, are we dealing with the wrong issue here? We're anthropomorphizing something where we're gonna end up having to regulate machine output. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah. And there is an argument that we may have, hit, that one of the long-term problems of AI is some of that information or data on which it's drawing may itself be defective. But anyway, yes, next question, yeah. Thank you. So, Jeremy Watson, I'm a member of the UK Committee on Research Integrity, and for my sins, I'm looking at AI with, with Jill Matheson and uh, Ian Gardner for MPL, and we're really concerned, really, about 
the use and abuse of artificial intelligence in generating research outcomes, um, potentially fictitious ones, paper mills, etc., and the danger that could imply to economy and human safety. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and then there's a, there's a couple of questions out on that side which we haven't covered before. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Robin May, Chief Scientific Advisor at the Food Standards Agency, another regulator. Um, uh, my question is that many AI applications are in other regulated areas like finance and medicines, and they're very soon going to bump up against this model of a globally regulated AI system, but a nationally regulated other system. How are we going to manage that, for example, for med medical diagnostics, where you may have one set of rules that apply globally and another in individual it countries? It won't be globally regulated. Don't mix the terms up. It won't be. I don't think. Did you mean that? It won't be globally regulated. Globa be glo globally coordinated, then. Let me put yeah, that. Well, that's a different thing, isn't it? Sorry. Right. Uh, okay. We get we get we get some barracking from the panel of the audience. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if only we could do that on any questions, it'd be so refreshing. Right. Okay. Yep. No barracking here. Sorry, David. You know me. Um, Tom Rogerson, the uh, head of Cotsmore Prep School. I think I'm a rare beast in the room. I'm a, 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 a teacher of small children. Um, I'm just going to reiterate slightly Winchester yeah. College's uh, question and ask if you can possibly tell us whether we should hang around until it's all regulated uh, before we leap in or do what we've done and uh, with lots of um, safeguards of our own um, try to um, introduce the children um, to AI in a, a very safe way. Um, yeah, and having one or two follow-up questions on that education issue. Yes, and, uh, uh, and let's go here. Up. I'm going to collect some more questions. Yes, the lady on the left there. She's been trying, right? yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Kerry from uh, Data Science Systems. Um, my question is, does UK have its own large language model? Uh, and uh, is it important that UK should have its right. own large language model? Okay. I understand this year there is a few new AI hub has been ex established. So one of the uh, AI hub is focused on generative AI uh, model. How is the government going to uh, fund the uh, computer power and manpower? Right. I'm going to start um, with Stephen, because again, there's, there's several questions about the regulatory function, and then turn to, to Wendy and other panelists. Stephen first. Thank you. And, and I'm, I'm going to be incredibly cheeky and, and, and copy what Wendy did and answer something not, not from uh, this round, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. from the round mm. before, but actually from the round before that, because yeah. um, I would quite like to come back um, to the question of, of deep fakes yeah. um, uh, here. Um, I suspect that some people would quite like me to as, as well. Um, yes, given that we were the regulator that was at the forefront of some of the challenges around Cambridge Analytica. Mm. Uh, I need to manage expectations um, here um, around the extent to which data protection law will be the most effective tool in the box for tackling deep fakes. Wendy's made the case for um, uh, alternative sort of models for tackling that. It's not for me to, um, uh, to talk about the policy solutions here around this. But what I can tell you is that if we're talking about a, uh, you know, a, a bad state actor or we're talking about some activists in attics, um, uh, knocking on their door and asking for their data protection impact assessment isn't going to do much to tackle that particular problem. So we do need to really think about what the right tools are for the right problems. And it goes right back to where we were earlier on about thinking, well, what's the sort of problem that we're coming up against um, and what's the, the right sort of regulatory, legislative, um, uh, alternative policy lever that we have available to us. Um, just to very briefly rattle through some of the others then, um, of course AI regulators need to be re re reflective um, and representative of the populations that we serve. Um, uh, otherwise we make mistakes. It's, it's as sim simple as that. We need, um, as within any organisation, enough um, uh, diversity of, of thought and background and insight that we are spotting the challenges that may emerge in other areas. And if we don't get that right, and we don't get the skills and capability and backgrounds right within our organisation, we are at risk of failure. Um, uh, is there potential for independent testing um, of models pre-market? 
Um, uh, yes, there's potential. Um, is it something that is uh, required, certainly under our own regulatory re regime? Um, no, not at present. I think there is an interesting question when we're talking about um, uh, certain um, sort of classes of, of models and whether that is in certain contexts. So, for example, obviously, with, um, there's medical devices. You would have some sorts of requirements in that space already. If you're talking about models that are at the root of lots of other use cases, would you expect something there? That's slightly outside my own purview. Right. Oh. Um, can I just press you on, on, com on a couple of points? I mean, this issue that came up from, with the Food Standards Agency example, but, but there's kind of, there's a quite a lively debate, and we heard, I think, Wendy give some examples, as to whether there are the laws and regulations we already have prohibit or will cover AI, or whether in reality we need to create large numbers of technology-specific regulations and rules around AI. And one of the historic arguments about technology is we've, some people would say, we've actually made a mistake in trying to regulate each technology and have insuff been insufficiently willing to use general legislation, including very crude things about, say, theft, in the context of AI. Where are you in that debate? How much new AI-specific regulation and law do we need? Um, so I, I probably fall into none of the camps that have been described around this one on, and so far. In as much as uh, I believe that uh, we're talking about, quite often, a general purpose technology that is applied in lots of different sectoral contexts, I do think that an approach which relies on the expertise and insight and frankly bandwidth to be able to cover those different contexts and use cases is important. But I don't, I, th I think the approach to handling gaps needs to be one of actually identifying what those gaps are rather than going right, should we reach for general cross-cutting, let's solve all AI with a giant AI regulatory regime type approaches. Actually, we should be more comfortable about saying, okay, what about this particular space? What about, for example, we've, we've just had um, an online safety act that's been passed, which is all about user-to-user -user interactions. Yeah. We're going to have a new world coming up in the not-too-distant future about lots of user-to-bot interactions, which are not necessarily yeah. covered within that sort of space. What's, what is going to cover those sorts of spaces? But having that difficult, nuanced, um, quite forensic conversation around where are the gaps here um, is going to re require quite a lot of work. And I'm really, well, yeah, every time somebody says they are going to develop a gap analysis, I'm very interested in seeing where that is going to go. Thank you. Uh, Sana, your observations on all that. Um, so a couple of thoughts for me on, on, on some of the questions that have come up. Um, I think one on a, on a few, three times, a, a questions ago around data poisoning. <laughs> Um, yeah. Interestingly, in the absence of the right regulatory landscape, um, some people are using data poisoning to protect themselves. Um, so artists, uh -huh. for example, um, and any anybody in the creative sector, um, there are entire companies that have been spun up that poison their IP so that when the web crawlers go over, across it, they can't reproduce their their work so in it, it's it's interesting because some of these same kind of mechanisms that can be used you know it, as always there's a double edge to these right um and in, in the absence of those kinds of things these things like this are happening right and um and and in the absence of us regulating well narrow ai to allow it to be used because we know it is being used but you know in the absence of these regulations either coming up directly, new ones being created or, or existing ones being applied, um, we, AI is having the exact opposite effect on productivity than we would like. So in, in big companies, we, you know, because of the liabilities that are faced, either companies aren't introducing um, any of the kind of features that allow them to become more productive 
or where they are and there is a question, it goes all the way up to the top of the company. And you know, the CEO is faced with trying to decide on something that would be should be decided on much lower in the in the company. And so it's taking up a lot of time and space in, in people's kind of addressing of these things. So I find it really interesting. Um, and I think on the, the there was a question around do we wait? Um, which, which for me around the unintended consequences. So I spoke to um, an expert in, in a global expert, at least um, this person themselves calls themselves this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> will remain nameless. Um, very well known. And the remark was, if you know, no one in the world has touched the national curriculum for many, many years, Right? And, if, and then the reason for that is because if you make a change, you're not going to know whether you got it right for 30 years. Right? So 30 years, you will, you will see the unintended consequences of your actions. Um, and so no one's willing to do that. But that doesn't mean that uh, no movement should be made. Now, I, I think educate, I mean, AI and education, mm. I look at it as the Wild West right now, right? Because it's unregulated, you don't know what's happening, yeah. who's doing what, to what extent, et cetera. But if schools themselves don't take this in their control, put in the right kind of principles and guidelines at the very least about how these technologies should be used by their students, but as well, but also by their teachers, um, it, it, they're probably being used <laughs> already. And so yeah. I think this, I'm, I'm with Wendy, I think the, the, you know, this is an area, it's exciting, it should be looked at as an exciting way, I think it should be embraced with intelligence and responsibility and thoughtfulness behind it. But I think if you try and stop it, you're just gonna get the wrong end because probably at least your students, but I suspect also your teachers, um, are already using these tools. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Cosmina? Uh, I want to pick on the question at the back about uh, research uh, and generating yeah. research outcomes. Um, I don't have an answer to it, but it does keep me up at night as well. And I think pressure within academia to publish is huge. Um, and there is a real risk that uh, you know people will turn to those technologies to produce some of the research that we're going to be, be seeing out. Um, I think there isn't, uh, also I think the peer review system is a little bit under threat oh. uh, as well. I don't think there's uh, any of us that have submitted a, a paper for publication recently who have not received some, some, some peer review from ChatGPT. Um, so, uh, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't have an answer, but I, I share the concern. Um, on children, um, we actually set up a project uh, together with UNICEF and the Scottish Parliament to look at creating ethical guidelines for, for, for children. And children are a little bit left behind in this discussion. Um, they're early adopters of those technologies. They're very professional users of those technologies. But they don't actually know how they operate and what risks they're exposing themselves to um, by using them. And one of the most exciting panel contributors um, that I have had the pleasure to listen to this year was um, a 70 year old girl who was pre precisely speaking about this issue. Right. Uh, Wendy? Um, so I just want to <coughs> apologize to the gentleman who I heckled, uh, but only in, the, only in the sense that you were asking the right question, I just think you, I picked up on your language, because actually of course the uh, there will be, as, as um, Sana and Cosmina talked about, the different regulatory regimes will evolve from different countries. From, and if there's a global governance body, then it needs to be able to um, uh, analyse uh, the, the overlaps and... Um, well, well, basically do... I'm going to say this. Basically do what Cosmina did, right, in that analysis, which was just fantastic, of the EU and, you, and you know, you're going to carry on and do that um, with all the across the world, aren't you? Do that mapping of the regulatory regimes tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, what none of us talked about the US, which doesn't have mm -hmm. one yet. If you read my book for internet, you'll see uh, exactly explains this because uh, for um, that so the same framework works for AI. Because of course, what I should have kept aside in what Biden did was the day Sunday before the summit, they um, yeah. he signed his executive order, which is a voluntary regulation. This is a little bit like 
saying, well, cancer, tobacco causes cancer, now tobacco companies go away and regulate yourselves, right? It's a, so there isn't, there isn't a regulatory regime in the US yet, and that's where all the companies are. So that's something we have to worry about. In terms of um, uh, AI and research and science, I'm, I'm co-chair of the, the ACM, Computer Science um, uh, Association of Computer Machinery Publications Board. We have, as all the publishers are, producing policies about the use of um, generative AI in both writing papers and reviews. Um, and we have disciplinary procedures. And we are actually, it's a hard work, but we are disciplining people when we, when we find them. And there's some amazing stuff goes on. I can't tell you in public, I'll tell you offline, some of the stuff that people do to cheat to get publications in. But the other thing I worry about, you said about peer review, is that in the AI world, they just put the papers into archive and don't bother to get them peer reviewed because there's too many papers in AI. There's um, not enough reviewers. So, and, and, and students don't any better, they're just citing them as if they're peer reviewed. There's no peer review. I think we are potentially facing the worrying, and I sit here in this yeah. institution which invented it, the end of peer review. I'm worried. I'm really deeply worried about that, and I'm hoping the Royal Society um, will lead something on that. You know, um, looking at that whole issue. And I'm just finally going to say, I think, oh, two things. No, two things. Somebody asked about how can online, how can um, developed countries help underdeveloped countries? I would like to put that round the other way. How can the underdeveloped countries help us get it right? I think we should stop saying we know how to do it because we don't. And here you are, you're going to have our AI take it or leave it and do as we do. We have to turn that rhetoric around. And I would cite, I know it's the biggest underdeveloped country, <coughs> India, the work they're doing on their digital public infrastructure, which I, um, is absolutely amazing. We could learn, we can and will learn so much from them. They're, they're now turning to, to AI, build how, how that internet stack works with AI. And Nandan Nilikani, who I'm a huge fan of, the one of the, the, he was one of the founders of Infosys, um, calls it DPIs now, um, digital public intelligence, is what he. And that we can learn yeah. so much from these people. Um, and should we have, should we have a sovereign LLM? Well, we did have a plan to have a sovereign LLM, but that became the AI Safety Institute. <laughs> it did. You look at me as if I'm mad. That's no, what I'm happened. Not, no, I was, right. I was intrigued. We had a plan. We had a plan that came out of the Turing Institute to, to, to question whether we should yeah. have a sovereign LLM, and that was another bit of the rabbit hole, you see. Right. So this is part of the rabbit hole, the, the preoccupation and of the safety. you know who's doing that? Taking our plan? Singapore. Right. And if you believe open AI in many other countries, mm -hmm. I think the idea of a sovereign LLM is being multiplied across multiple countries, just not us. Not us. We, we, we went down the rabbit hole of the AI Safety Institute, which is fantastic, but we threw so many babies out with that bathwater. Right. Very good. Now, John, we are, we are getting to end. We, we have actually overshot. But, John, you, we're going to give the last word to you. Don't make it too scary. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, not domestic. So you, but you tell us where you think all this is heading I'll, and the role that regulation could play. I'll end on not too I'll, I'll, I'll make two quick points then. So on, on the one about... Global, sorry, um, global versus national regulation. Also bringing in the, the Greenland point, I think there's a th there is a possibility that the UK ends up in a sort of nugatory position on the way it regulates AI, if, as things are playing out at the moment, it aims to be slightly more permissive than the EU, because most of the businesses that I talk to, tech companies and also sort of larger organisations who are implementing this into their work, they just say. Well, we'll make sure we're compliant with the EU because we need to, because the EU law yeah. says if we deal with any EU customers, we have to be compliant, and that will take yeah. care of the UK. Like and so whatever work the UK does to sort of fine-tune this perfect regulatory model will basically be wasted because everybody will just do what the EU tells them to do anyway. I think that's a very real risk. That's a negative thing, but um, there you go. On the positive note, just to sort of plus one, the, the points about education, yes. um, I do think this is one of the most um, exciting areas for the application of um, language models. I think that the prospects for the right models, not ChatGPT trained off the general internet, but the right models carefully tuned to reflect learning the curriculum and so on, I think will have um, frankly profound impacts on the way the education system works. I think in, in history textbooks of the future, when we look at the sort of evolution of education in Britain, we'll have you know the 1902 
Balfour Act, primary education for all, we'll have the Butler Act, secondary education for all, and then there will be a chapter on the introduction of automated LLM robo teaching or whatever for all across the UK and the impact that had on the sort of the children and learning um, of the nation. So I'm extremely optimistic about that. So there you go, an optimistic note to end on. Yeah, apart from for the teachers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> may have a mixed reaction <laughs> right thank you very much indeed I'm sorry we weren't able to get every question in either online or from our physical audience but that just shows how many people are interested in this we were very fortunate to have such a an expert and well informed panel thank you very much to our panellists for their contributions uh, a recording of this event will be on the foundation's website tomorrow together with the slides of course our next uh, event is on the 27th of March. It's about uh, nuclear fusion to generate all the electricity we're going to need to operate these bloody systems. Thank you all very much indeed.